Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome as usual to another evening of uh, the PEMSA talks um, based on cases, uh, which you will be coming across at the exams. And this is particularly based, um, or rather targeted uh, specifically for the students. So uh, this evening, I'd like to welcome Dr. Udeni Herat. She is a consultant psychiatrist at uh, Base Hospital Marvanella, and um, she is an alumnus of uh, the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peladini. She's from the 92-93 batch. She will be coming as an examiner for your exams in the future, and she's going to be talking about a very, very relevant and important topic, which invariably you will come across at the exam level. Uh, and that is how to approach a patient presenting with alcohol withdrawal. And Madam will spend some time um, responding to your queries or any, any doubts that you may have pertaining to this topic uh, towards the end. Feel free to um, clarify any, anything related to this topic with her towards the end. Um, Udeni, it's all yours. You can share your slides if you have some slides through the share screen option. Shall we oh, give it? Right. Yeah. Thank you very Good evening, everybody. I hope you all can hear me. Good evening, madam. We can hear you. Yeah, right. So the topic that I, I have chosen today to discuss with you for the psychiatric teaching session is uh, how to approach the diagnosis and management of the patient who is having alcohol withdrawal. Uh, so this may not be directly relevant to psychiatry because alcohol management of alcohol withdrawal is mainly a medical management. Uh, but then uh, we, uh, in the psychiatry team, will usually come across a lot of patients with alcohol withdrawal in liaison psychiatry. Uh, so, and also when you pass out and work as doctors, uh, it's a very common presentation that you will come across when you work in most of the wards, medical, be it be medical wards, surgical wards, casualties, orthopedic, anywhere. It's very common for you to see patients who are suffering from alcohol withdrawal. So it would be good for you to have some understanding of how to diagnose this condition early and how to manage it properly. So I, will, I thought of starting this by discussing with you a case scenario. This is uh, a scenario of a patient. Can, just one second? can I can I just interrupt you for a second? But then if you yes. don't mind, can you put it to the um, the full screen, the okay. slideshow option so that right. um, we can just see your slide only otherwise the peripheral yeah. parts also. That's perfect. Right. Okay. Yeah, brilliant. Right. Uh, so this patient, uh, was admitted to the medical ward at Marvanella. He was a 55-year-old male, and uh, he had been suffering from a febrile illness for three days prior to admission. And on second day of admission, the patient, the staff had noticed that the patient is becoming increasingly agitated, uh, tremulous, and he was found to be disoriented. Uh, he was quite agitated throughout the day, but it was slight worse towards the night and he had impaired sleep and on observation he was he appeared very fearful anxious and he was responding to unreal stimuli uh, and there was misinterpretations and misidentifications note, note, which could be noticed so this response to un unreal stimuli are uh, actually they are hallucinations where, where we call uh, uh, Hallucinations are something that uh, 
that the patient experience when there is no stimuli, actual stimuli. Uh, misinterpretations are misinterpreting things are when they are actual the actual stimuli in the environment is misinterpreted by the patient. Sometimes when they can see a wire and they can think, think that this is a snake or, or a shadow, they think that they are animals. So, and misidentification is this, the real people in the environment, they tend to misidentify. And also, um, the patient was found to be having profuse sweating and his blood pressure was fluctuating to the in the higher side. And his pulse rate was also increased and he had, was running a mild temperature. The family confirmed that the patient was using alcohol heavily for a long time. And they also gave a history of repeated falls under influence of alcohol. So when you go through this case scenario, it's, it's obvious that the patient is in, in a delirious state where the patient is confused and then there was a lot of they confused his was he's disoriented having hallucinations so when when we see a case, when we see a patient with delirium like this it is not a diagnosis you have to think what is causing the delirium so from the initial presentation you tend to form uh, uh, tend to form a list of differential diagnosis in your mind from the initial presentation itself uh, before you go on to assess the patient further. So the differential diagnosis that I can think of when I see this patient is could it be head injury because the patient is a al al person who has been using alcohol and they tend to f have repeated falls and the family does confirm that the patient has uh, did fall several times over the recent past. So it's a known complication in alcohol using people to have undetected injuries in the head, especially subdural hemorrhages. And also because the patient gives a history of fever, could it be infection that involves the brain, something like encephalitis, meningitis, or the systemic infection uh, that is in affecting the brain? Or it could be a metabolic derangement, we don't know. Could be hypoglycemia, because hypoglycemia could be presenting in a similar way with agitation, profuse sweating, confusion, and also hyponatremia also can give rise to a similar picture. And also, uh, very probable, uh, it's very probable that patient could be having substance withdrawal, especially withdrawal from alcohol. Uh, or, we don't know, it could be a representation of a psychiatric illness because sometimes a patient who is very anxious or a patient who is florid is psychotic can present in this way because they appear very anxious, they are very agitated by their psychotic experiences, they can have sweating. Uh, so we have to sort out what the problem is, so what the cause of his delirium is. So how could we proceed with this uh, patient. So not only this patient, in any patient in the clinical settings, we have to first assess the patient to find out what the problem is and then we would arrange, we would go to a management plan. So the assessment is done with uh, intention of coming to a diagnosis. Now we have a differential diagnosis but we need a diagnosis to commence treatment on this patient. And also, we, with the assessment will help in a risk assessment. The risk assessment is something uh, that we especially do in psychiatric assessment in psychiatric patients, but I think it should be done in all patients. Uh, the risk assessment is done with a view of assessing the risk towards the patient and also risk towards others uh, by the patient. And also the information that we will get from the assessment will guide us in the management as well. Uh, information like uh, how, how about his alcohol use, whether he has suffered from past uh, withdrawals, uh, the level of family support, whether he has uh, any other comorbid medical conditions. There's a lot of information we need to gather in the assessment, which will guide us in the management. So, the, so 
The assessment will include taking a history and preferably a collateral history, especially in this patient, we will not be able to take a history from the patient, but we would need a good collateral history from the family. And also to do a mental state examination of the patient. And the mental state examination is also something unique in psychiatric assessments. The mental state assessment assesses the patient's current mental state. The history and the collateral history would give us an idea of how his mental state had been over the recent past. But the, men, in the mental state examination is the, the current mental state of the patient, where you assess the patient's uh, appearance, his behavior, his speech, his mood, his thought content, and whether he has any perceptual abnormalities. And all this will give you an idea of the patient's current mental state, which will also help us in the diagnosis and in the management. The physical examination is also very important to check the patient's blood pressure, pulse rate, the respiration, and also the systemic functions. And then you go on to do the investigations, which will also help us to come to a diagnosis. The management of this patient, but there will be a non-pharmacological component or, and also the pharmacological treatment and the social management. In the delirious patient, the non-pharmacological non management is also very important. Where you need a lot of supportive care and also the, you have to talk to the patient and family and that will help to reassure the patient and the family and the, the family and the patient education. They should start from the first point where you see the patient and it should go on till you at uh, finally discharge the patient and also in the follow-up. You have to let them know what the cause problem is and the causes, uh, the management options and what sort of treatment we are going to give him, the side effects and also the prognosis. It's good practice to do this because it helps in the patient's improvement as well because the compliance improves and also the patient uh, psychological state improves when you tend to talk to the patient and family. So for you to properly diagnose and manage a patient, it's always good to know what alcohol withdrawal syndrome is. So it's a syndrome where, there's a, it's where you see a set of signs and symptoms that can occur following abrupt cessation of use of alcohol or if you reduce the amount of use of alcohol after using it excessively for a period of time. Uh, so this withdrawal symptoms commonly occurs in people who are dependent on alcohol. So alcohol dependence, uh, there are, there are a set of criteria for you to diagnose alcohol dependence. Uh, so you, you, it's good for you to read what is dependence. There are six criteria for you to diagnose a person with alcohol dependence and out of this a person should have three positive criteria for at least three months over the last one year. Uh, if you have that, the person is called dependent on a substance. Um, so uh, the withdrawal is common, it's very common to occur in people who are alcohol dependent, where about 50% of alcohol dependent persons can go into clinically relevant alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Uh, but sometimes it can also occur in people who have been using alcohol for a short period, uh, for a single, a single episode of heavy prolonged use also can cause lead to alcohol withdrawal. For example, if a person has been drinking heavily over four or five days, if he suddenly stops, he also can develop alcohol withdrawal even though he's not dependent. And the interesting thing is, especially in our setup, most of our patients who are abusing alcohol, alcohol or dependent on alcohol, they are not aware that they are dependent on alcohol. And then they don't accept it. And also, they don't know the risk that they might go into withdrawal when they stop or reduce the use, the amount of use. So when, when you consider the signs and symptoms of alcohol withdrawal, uh, they, the, the symptoms and signs can occur very early once the patient stops 
the drink uh, use, uh, using alcohol can start early as four to six hours or it can start a few days later even. So the withdrawal state is, can range from mild withdrawal state to severe withdrawal state. The importance is the mild withdrawal state can go unnoticed. Like if you don't look for it and if you don't predict it, uh, the mild stage can go unnoticed. So that is why it's important to take the history to know the amount of alcohol the person has been using. If he has been using heavy amounts of alcohol, you know that there's a chance that this patient can go into severe withdrawal. And also if the patient has had withdrawals when they stopped in the past, then the, the, the likelihood of him developing withdrawal this time is also high. So even detecting mild withdrawal is important for you to be on guard to see whether the patient might go into severe withdrawal. And if you don't intervene, intervene uh, so you can uh, implement in, in, uh, interventions earlier. So the symptoms and signs of alcohol withdrawal uh, are the signs of delirium. Now, delirium uh, could, can occur in two ways, like it, it could be a hyperactive state or a hypoactive state. In alcohol withdrawal, the delirium is a hyperactive state, and they are the symptoms and signs uh, are, are suggestive of a hyperactive state. Uh, the anxiety, you can see it manifests as agitation. They can have insomnia, vivid dreams, vivid and frightening dreams. They can have tremors, uh, and also, and also they have uh, symptoms of sym a sympathetic overdrive, where they have uh, increased heart rate, bl high blood pressure, palpitations. Uh, and this patient has also the very prominent thing in alcohol withdrawal is they have profuse, profuse sweating. Uh, and they have anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. So in the mild withdrawal state, which starts around four to six hours or 12, uh, 12 or up to 12 hours after stopping the last, stopping using alcohol, uh, they can have one, two or three of these symptoms in, the, in, in a mild level. Uh, and when they go in with more severe withdrawal, the, these symptoms and signs become more severe, where they are the tremors become very, very prominent, and there's extreme agitation, and the confusion also becomes worse, and also they start hallucinating. And the hallucinations is more prominent in the visual modality, but they can also have tactile and auditory hallucinations. I think you must have heard about the term delirium tremens. So this is the most severe type of withdrawal syndrome. And it's called delirium tremens because the patient has delirium and they have tremors. So 5% of patients who, who have withdrawal can have the risk of going to withdrawal tremens. And the on, onset of withdrawal tremens could be from about two to three days and it, it can last up to one to five days. Uh, so it is very important to remember that the onset of delirium tremens can be in two to three days because sometimes the patient can present early and then they have mild withdrawal symptoms and you treat the withdrawal symptoms and then you think the patient is better and then you send him home and then they develop with the with delirium tremens at home. Uh, the, and this is this is, uh, this delirium tremens is a medical emergency where you need to manage the patient and attend to the patient very closely because it carries a very significantly high mortality rate. So in delirium tremens, the patient is confused, where there is disorientation and there is altered consciousness. He has prominent perceptual disturbances and symptoms of sympathetic overdrive as we discussed earlier with tachycardia, hypertension and tachypnea, the agitation and tremors are very severe and there is profuse sweating and also he can have hypothermia. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of, there, the, the patient can develop a lot of complications in this situation where the hyperventilation can lead to high blood flow and cause clouding of consciousness or clouding of sensorium. 
and also they can be hypovolemic because of the excessive sweating and hypothermia and they are vomiting and also their oral intake is also low. And fluid and electrolyte disturbance is also a common problem in this situation where they can get hypokalemia, they can have hypomagnesemia which can cause cardiac dysrhythmias and predispose the patient to seizures and also hypophosphatemia which will also known to cause cardiac failure and this leads to the, the complications that increase the mortality in these patients where they can get cardiac arrhythmias, they can have seizures and aspiration pneumonia, they can have head in, head central nervous system injury due to physical injuries or due to metabolic derangements that occur and also it can worsen if the patient has underlying medical illnesses such as pancreatitis and hepatitis which is common in alcohol uh, abusing patients. They, this can exacerbate these situations and cause death in these patients. So when we talk about withdrawal seizures, withdrawal seizures uh, also occur in the severe state of uh, alcohol withdrawal and this usually occurs within 12 to 48 hours after the last drink. Uh, it is, the withdrawal seizures are usually generalized tonic-clonic convulsions and they usually tend to occur either as a singular seizure or a brief flurry of seizures over a short period. So if the patient is having any other type of seizure other than tonic-clonic seizures like a fo for example a focal seizure or if the patient has continuous seizures or status epilepticus you have to think that this is not just pure and simple alcohol withdrawal, there, there could be something else that is involved, a comorbid, uh, comorbid condition such as head injury or infection or something, you have to think of some uh, a comorbid condition and you have to do the investigations accordingly. And the withdrawal seizures is common to occur in a person who has been drinking for a long time, for 10, 15 years. So it tend to occur more in people who present in the fourth and fifth decade in life. Uh, and also persons who, the, the risk of withdrawal seizures is more in people who have had withdrawal seizures in the past. And also people who had had repeated alcohol withdrawals in the past, they tend to have the, the risk of having withdrawal seizures are more. And these withdrawal seizures are the highest risk for the patients uh, having alcohol withdrawal because they have the risk of aspiration and which can cause pneumonia and cerebral oxygen deprivation and can cause physical injury. So if the withdrawal, at the stage of withdrawal seizures, you have to actively manage the patient because this is very easily the patient goes into delirium tremens if we, at this stage, if you don't manage the patient. So, I would like to talk about another uh, uh, term, alcoholic hallucinosis that we use uh, in the symptoms. And in alcohol withdrawal, in the, at the early stages, people, some people tend to get hallucinations. So, this, uh, this uh, the initial hallucinations may not be necessarily be delirium tremens. So, hence they have been given this the term alcoholic hallucinosis. So, to differentiate alcoholic hallucinosis from the hallucinations that you get in delirium tremens uh, is from uh, is by the in alcoholic hallucinosis the, the they, they 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 don't have uh, confusion. Uh, and also they don't have uh, any changes in their vital signs. So uh, for you to differentiate, it is because it's important to differentiate because uh, alcoholic hallucinosis is not, uh, it's not delirium tremens if the patient's sensorium is intact and if they don't have uh, changes in their vital signs. Like, uh, blood pressure, pulse rate, if they are normal. And also people who are having alcoholic hallucinosis, they are aware that they are hallucinating. They know, they talk about it. Like they say that I can hear this, I can see things, and they are very distressed about it. Uh, so 
so for you to understand the symptoms and signs of alcohol withdrawal and also to understand the management it's good for you to know something about the pathophysiology of alcohol withdrawal uh, so alcohol exerts its effect by, by its action mainly and its action on the brain uh, now the brain has both uh, inhibitory and excited neurotransmitters that is usually in balance to maintain homeostasis. Uh, the main inhibited neurotransmitter in the brain is gamma aminobutyric acid and it acts via a receptor called GABA receptors. There are two types of GABA receptors, GABA A and and the main excited neurotransmitter in the brain is glutamate, which acts on the n methyl aspartate or NMDA receptors. So when alcohol acts on the GABA receptors, it causes a central nervous system depression. We know that alcohol is a CNS depressant. So uh, when you continuously consume alcohol over a prolonged period, continuously and uh, use alcohol in large amounts over a long time, this tend to inhibit the central nervous system more and more so that uh, the inhibition on the central nervous system is more. So uh, as a compensatory mechanism, like the body always tries to adapt to any change that occurs in the body. And because this has been happened, when this happens over a long time, the body changes uh, and uh, they, they use as compensatory mechanisms over this continuous inhibition on the brain by alcohol by increase by two ways they do do this by two ways they decrease the number of GABA receptors in the brain and also they increase the number of NMDA receptors that the excited receptors in the brain uh, so that they can achieve a balance over this continuous inhibition that is caused by alcohol and then as long as you the person consumes alcohol it's good it's all right but if the patient suddenly stops using alcohol or if he reduces the amount of alcohol that he uses, the inhibition on the brain by alcohol is gone. And now the number of GABA receptors are also low. So the inhibition that can occur through the GABA in the brain is also low. But the NMT receptor, the excited number of excited receptors are more. So the brain goes into a high, hyper excitable stage. And this is manifested as the the symptoms of hyperexcitability in alcohol withdrawal. So as, as I told previously, the alcohol withdrawal does carry a very significant mortality rate. And previously, this was very high. It was 10 to 20%. But now, since the management and the early identification and early uh, management, the risk of mortality has gone down now to 5%, but that is also a significant amount. And death usually occurs from cardiac dis arrhythmias, pneumonia, and also complications of comorbid conditions the patient had prior to withdrawal. So I would like to talk to you about this scale, uh, the SIVA AR scale, which is the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment Scale of Alcohol, because this is the scale that is usually used here uh, to assess the severity of withdrawal in uh, alcohol withdrawing patients. So I know that Peradeniya Psychiatry Unit uses this scale, like when I was a trainee there, I used to uh, use this scale uh, under the guidance of the consultant uh, and also this is a common scale that is being used overseas also uh, to assess alcohol withdrawal uh, severity in patients so it's good for you to the students to know something about this scale and it's good for you to try to uh, do this with the patients that you you may have in the board. Uh, so that's the best 
using this scale will guides us to guides us in the management like where that needed uh, it uh, will be guided uh, by the score that the scale uh, implementing this score more severe the withdrawal so if you do any medical treatment but you need to not going to severe withdrawal uh, scores between 10 to 15 is mild withdrawal and 16 to 20 is moderate withdrawal and more than 20 is considered as having severe withdrawal So in the management plan of this patient, you have to decide on the treatment setting. You have to decide what investigations you have to do, and then you have to decide on the pharmacological treatment and the follow-up plan. So the treatment setting, uh, alcohol withdrawal patients are being managed as outpatients. And for this, you have to, the, the, you have to choose which patient can be managed as, as an outpatient. So the any patient who you are going to manage as an outpatient, the symptoms should be less than moderate. And also the patient should be a reliable patient, like he should be compliant with the medications and the management plan that is being implemented for him to do follow at home. And he need, there needs to be good family support to support the patient and to monitor the uh, medical treatment. Uh, and also you need to give very clear instructions to the patient and family about the medications, the side effects, and the expected withdrawal symptoms, and also what to do if the symptoms worsen. The problem with the outpatient treatment in our setting is we need if you to, to do outpatient detoxification, you need to it's, you need to see the patient frequently, like you need to see the patient daily and I don't know how So any patient who has more than moderate withdrawal symptoms, they need to be managed in the hospital. So history of severe withdrawal symptoms, or if he has a history of withdrawal seizures, delirium tremens, and if the patient, we have attempted withdrawal, uh, withdrawal in the community but it had failed, or if the patient has other comorbid psychiatric or medical illnesses, we have to consider inpatient detoxification of that patient. So the investigations that we would do in a patient like this is we need to do the baseline investigations because we have to correct all, all the uh, metabolic derangements for the patient's condition to improve. So you have to do a random blood sugar level, serum electrolytes. It's always good to know his baseline liver functions and renal function tests because that will guide us in which medications we have to use. And also for doing full blood count and the CRP will exclude infections. And also according to the his assessment results, we have to decide whether we would need to do a brain CT, lumbar puncture or EEG. And so in the management, the basic thing is to control the symptoms and also supportive care. So if the patient has other comorbidities, you have to liaise with the medical and the surgical team and you have to treat the comorbidities. And in a delirious patient, supportive care is very important. So patient should be placed in a quiet, low stimulus environment. The environment should be protective because the patient is very agitated and there's a risk that patient might come to, the harm, come to some harm for himself and also the, his caregiver. So the environment should, should be safe. And if the patient is in delirium tremens, he would need a lot of monitoring. And also because in delirium tremens we might have to use high doses of benzodiazepines. So it, it's uh, preferable the pay, if the patient is in a high dependency unit where you can monitor the patient's pulse, BP, the oxygen saturation, and all that. And frequent reorientation and reassurance is also a principle in managing patients with delirium. And mechanical restraints, we do use mechanical restraints in people who are agitated and disturbed, which at least for a short period, this is done with the intention of preventing the patient harming himself 
or harming others, but this should, this should be removed as soon as the chemical sedation is achieved. And preferably if you can have one-to-one -one nursing care, that would be the ideal situation or else you have to see the patient very frequently, monitor the patient uh, and supportive care should be given. So for the symptom control, the main preferable agent uh, in alcohol withdrawal is benzodiazepine. So this is, this is how the management of uh, the delirium of alcohol withdrawal differs from the delirium of, of other causes because uh, delirium that is caused by other causes, we tend to avoid benzodiazepines because that causes con worsens the confusion of the patient. But in alcohol withdrawal, this is because now we, we, we spoke about the pathophysiology of alcohol withdrawal, where the alcohol acts on GABA receptors in the brain, and benzodiazepines also acts on the GABA receptors in the brain. So by giving benzodiazepines, you are almost like replacing alcohol in the brain. Uh, and unlike when, uh, so you, you can, what you do is you give benzodiazepines and slowly, gradually tail it off. So it gives time for the body's receptors to adapt uh, by using benzodiazepines. So, it, so benzodiazepines can control the site mode agitation and also it prevents progression from mild withdrawal to severe withdrawal. Antipsychotics are not recommended uh, in the treatment of alcohol withdrawal delirium, but it is being used at times where when you have to give very large doses of benzodiazepines, but still the patient is agitated and it's still the antipsychotics, but we have to do it cautiously because the risk of uh, antipsychotics reducing the seizure threshold in these patients. So, if you do use an antipsychotic, it should be antipsychotic like non-sedating antipsychotic like haloperidol, where the where it's the risk of seizures would be minimal. So the choice we we have a wide range of benzodiazepines. So the choice of which agent to use would be based on the pharmacokinetics and the patient's condition. So the preferred and benzodiazepine would be the long-acting benzodiazepines because this will help a smoother withdrawal and also the rebound withdrawal symptoms will be less likely to occur with long-acting benzodiazepines. So we do have long-acting benzodiazepines in our hospital setup like diazepam, chlorodiazepoxide. And if a person cannot take orally, diazepam can be used parenterally, but it should be intravenous only because diazepam is not effective intramuscularly. Uh, and intermediate agents like lorazepam and carbamazepine is also another medication that has been shown in trials to be effective in mild to moderate withdrawal symptoms. Uh, this carbamazepine is, is known to be used in, uh, uh, in uh, countries like uh, UK in their treatment guidelines uh, because it has the added advantage where it decreases craving uh, for alcohol after the withdrawal and also it does, it's, not a, it's not a sedating and it has little potential for abuse. But uh, it doesn't have sufficient clinical evidence uh, to be effective in uh, severe withdrawal of seizures or delirium. So, uh, I have not seen carbamazepine being used much in in our country. I don't know whether it's, if it would be effective in managing C. Another important thing that I want to talk separately uh, in managing withdrawal is the thiamine replacement. This is extremely important that the thiamine is replaced at, early, at the earliest possible stage uh, because this prevents progression of severe withdrawal to severe withdrawal as well as vernicase encephalopathy. Uh, vernicase encephalopathy is the acute manifestation of severe thiamine deficiency in the brain 
and if this is not addressed uh, immediately it can go the, the this can cause permanent brain damage which is cause of syndrome so it is important that you replace thiamine at the early early uh, earliest the preferred route to use thiamine is parental because thiamine part of the small intestine and usually in long term alcohol users the absorption is poor so to ensure uh, the medication reaching the patient's uh, system you have better to use parental route you can uh, use either im or iv route but if you give iv you have to take cautions against anaphylaxis give uh, a slow iv infusion reaction to the uh, IV thiamine. Uh, so in severe withdrawal, you give doses equivalent to the treatment dose of Wernicke's encephalopathy. So the, I would like to just briefly talk about this uh, dosing schedules of benzodiazepines. Uh, there are different dosing schedules that uh, people use. Uh, so I don't know whether you need to know a lot at the medical student level, but then you, you can go and read about this uh, fixed schedule therapy where in which benzodiazepines are given at fixed intervals, even if the patient's symptoms are there or not. Uh, so this is less evidence-based, but then it, it's commonly used uh, even in our setup. Uh, so this, the you, this is useful because this prevents the patient from going into withdrawal. Uh, and also, it's easy for the patient, a person who look after the patient as well, because less uh, frequent assessments are required when you give a fixed dose therapy. Uh, symptom triggered therapy uh, is uh, better uh, because for the patient, because you don't have to give pay, pay, uh, the pay, uh, person medications unnecessarily. Yeah. So uh, it, it is the recommend. It is recommended for most patients with alcohol uh, to treat alcohol withdrawal. Uh, yeah, you monitor the patient, and when you when the patient develops alcohol withdrawal symptoms, according to the level of the symptom severity, you treat the patient with the call the appropriate dose of benzodiazepine. But here you need to frequently assess the patient. The, the, there's another dosing schedule called front-loading therapy where you give large doses at very frequent intervals at the in outset of the treatment. And this is usually used in severe alcohol withdrawal patients who, where there is a risk that the patient can develop complications if you, the, man, the, the withdrawal is not managed quickly, especially people who have cardiac disease. Uh, but this is not recommended in people who have respiratory, respiratory people who have respiratory problems. So, in front loading therapy, because large doses are given, you have to have facilities for monitoring the patients on respiration and oxygen saturation, and also the antidote for benzodiazepine should also be available, which is flu mesonide. So I think that is all I have to say about uh, alcohol withdrawal and its management. Hope it was useful. Elaborate again is uh, like you, for you to understand that severe alcohol withdrawal is a medical emergency, and early detection and appropriate interventions will prevent complications and the mainstay in and management of health have to use adequate doses to control symptoms and the importance of you can't uh, uh, i mean and you you it's really important that the time in replacement is done as early as possible uh, to prevent the patient from going into permanent brain damage Okay, so if you have any questions 
about uh, what I have been talking about. I am happy to answer them. Hello. Jenny, thank you so much. I think you have gone through so much trouble to explain in detail mm -hmm. and you have pitched it perfectly at the medical student. Yes. So, thank you so much okay. once again. On behalf of the organizing committee, I'm really grateful that you took this up because it's like like we discussed a very, very important part, not only to pass, pass, the, pass the exam, isn't it? Yes. But yes. in every aspect in your life, in your career as a doctor, you will invariably come across this in no matter what speciality you choose. Yeah. So I think Madam can, will spend a few minutes clarifying any doubts that you all may have. Oh, then is that okay? They may yeah. have a quick question. If you can okay. spend a few minutes. Students, you are free to, I mean, anything related to alcohol and whatever Madam spoke about today, if there's any doubts or anything else that you want to clarify in, with regards to the topic of alcohol uh, use, please make this, make use of this opportunity. We can spend maybe five to ten minutes, depending on the number of questions. Thanks, Udeni. You're welcome. Hello. Yes, to the students. Yes. Y'all are. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I see a question in the chat box. The one has asked uh -huh. the thiamine is used in both delirium tremens and vernicus encephalopathy. Uh, yes, thiamine has to be used in delirium tremens as early as possible because uh, in this is this is given to prevent vernicus encephalopathy uh, because uh, usually we. We know that alcohol dependent persons, they, we, when we take histories from the family, they say that they drink but they don't eat properly. Like so they can be anyway, they can be deficient in their thiamine levels. And also when they go into withdrawal, the brain goes into a hyper excited stage where the metabolic demand also goes up. So uh, so they so it is it is because of that it is important to replace thiamine. And this has to be done before you in, in give glucose to the patient, uh, because when you give glucose, there will be because to use the glucose, you use up the uh, whatever time in amount you have in the brain or any already, and then the deficiency becomes more. So the vital centers in the brain will not have time in, and then they will not be able to use the glucose. So. Even in alcohol withdrawal, you give thiamine to prevent vernicus encephalopathy. And if you suspect vernicus encephalopathy, then there again you have to give large doses of thiamine. Uh, I see another question. He, he, someone had asked in the long case after establishing the diagnosis of dependence. Is there any use of asking cage questions? Are we supposed to do that? I, I don't think so. Like if you have established a diagnosis of dependence, I don't think you need to go to cage because cage is a screening questionnaire. Uh, so if you have established a diagnosis of dependence, I don't think there's a point of you doing cage. I think Sayuri would agree with me. Yeah, yeah, completely agree because yeah. see, cage is like uh, like Udeni mentioned, cage is a screening tool, right? So you screen for patients, but if you have taken a detailed history, so you screen for alcohol dependence, right? Yeah. Uh, whether this person may be having alcohol dependence, and then of course, when y'all are taking a long case on the case, y'all are going through the ICD criteria, and that is a very detailed, established way of. Um, confirming the diagnosis, whereas cage is just a very superficial screening tool. Yeah. Got it? So you taking a history, ticking and uh, looking for ICD-10 criteria is what is required, not cage. Okay? Someone has asked whether alcohol with, uh, when it is encephalopathy is included under alcohol withdrawal state, 
or is it a separate entity? You know, vernicase, alcohol withdrawal, vernicase encephalopathy is not, does not come under alcohol withdrawal. It's a separate entity. Uh, so, it, it, vernicase encephalopathy can occur due to various other reasons as well, where the reason for vernicase encephalopathy is thiamine deficiency. Uh, so, it, it will be good for you to read about vernicase encephalopathy where even high premises gravidarum can also cause uh, is a risk factor for vernicase encephalopathy. So that there, it is because of thiamine deficiency. Yeah, thanks Udeni because that is an area that you all tend to get a little bit confused about because um, don't think that vernicase encephalopathy is a part of alcohol withdrawal or alcohol dependence, right? Like mm -hmm. Madam said, vernicase is due to thiamine deficiency and there are so many causes of thiamine deficiency, right? Like Madam said, the hyperemetic mothers, then, you know, people with this gastric uh, surgeries where yes. absorption is impaired, right? So, so many people are vulnerable to develop vernicase alcohol dependent or heavy users of alcohol are just one such category of people it's just that like Pedro mentioned very beautiful in the in the in the discussion right alcohol users tend to neglect their meals so the intake is poor then their time in stores are poor right then their absorption rates are also impaired so for a variety of reasons associated with alcohol they are more vulnerable to get time in depleted. So that is why whenever you get a withdrawal patient, we, under the assumption that this patient is a heavy user or a dependent user and therefore we assume that there is a simultaneous time in deficient state, we uh, treat that also, isn't it to them? Yes. It doesn't mean yeah. that this is part and parcel of alcohol dependence because at the receptor level it's two different things. Okay, y'all are clear on that. Also, someone has asked whether uh, in per person has features of vernicase encephalopathy, do we still have to start treatment with thiamine? Of course, we have to start thiamine because vernicase encephalopathy is the earliest stage where the, the person has started, uh, the brain has started uh, getting the effects of thiamine deficiency. So you have to replace thiamine in large doses, large and more fre frequent doses. Uh, so it will prevent vernicase from going into permanent brain damage, which is the Korsakoff syndrome. And also, as there's another question someone has asked whether thiamine can be given IM or IV. Yes, we can use both routes, but as I have I explained in the discussion, if you prefer you want to give IV, you have to be cautious about the possibility of per, the person developing a reaction. Some people can get even anaphylaxis reaction to IV use of thiamine. So if you give IV, you tend to give the initial, initially you give a very slow IV infusion. And if the patient doesn't have any problems, you can continue to give IV thiamine. Then someone else has asked whether we, we use disulfiram along with benzodiazepines. Yes, another question, uh, another person is asking whether disulfiram therapy is used along with benzodiazepines. No, uh, we don't use disulfiram during the withdrawal stage. So disulfiram is a medication that you use for relapse prevention. That is after the withdrawal, now you have to manage the patient's dependence. So, uh, and prevent relapse, going to relapse of alcohol dependence. So, disulfiram is used uh, to prevent relapse of the dependence. There's a lot of questions they, they're asking. So, if if my email can be given yes, to yes. them, I can answer their questions. I can send emails uh, like... Certainly. Certainly. You can take your time yeah. and get back to them. Yes. Do it just this evening. No, no, I, I, I'm happy to answer because a lot of they're asking a lot of questions, so we don't have the time, sufficient time. Email, madam. You then, if you don't mind, just drop your email in the chat box if that's okay with you. Okay. Um, yeah. they can get back to you and right. you can maybe on an individual level. 
um anything else you want to quickly ask or shall, if not shall we wind up for this evening um so i want to thank dr deni herat i mean you took a lot of time to prepare the slides and like i said i think it was pitched perfectly and it was very engageable so thank you so much for doing this for us and students it is for you all okay madam is not gaining anything by doing this It's just taking time out of a nice evening with her family just for the sake of teaching you all okay so hope you all gained the maximum um feel free to drop an email to madam okay she will uh, clarify your doubts udeni thank you so much once again hopefully you can uh, help us again in the future for the coming batches thank you so much okay you're welcome good night everybody stay safe good night